Hi, I'm Alexa. I am a marketing and exhibitions fellow here at the Wright Gallery. And today we're going to hear from two incredible artists, Margarita Benitez and Marcus Vogel. They are joining us all the way from Kent, and they are going to tell us a little bit about their artwork, their inspiration, and their journey. They have a piece here in the show in the biennial exhibition that we have going on. It is on display until January 10th, so be sure to come out and see it. And without further ado, Margarita and Marcus. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. And thanks to the Wright Gallery for having us. Uh, my name is Marcus Vogel. I'm an associate professor at the University of Akron. I, uh, I'm a video artist, but primarily teaching graphic design. And I'm Margarita Benitez. I'm at Kinsey University in the Fashion School, and I'm also the fashion technologist there. So we ended up in disciplines of design, but our background is in art and interactive art, and we've been collaborating since 2000? Yes, a long time. It's been time. a while. So we're really excited to be here and talk about our journey and talk about our work. <coughs> Sorry for that. Um, so we have individual MFAs. We work in transmedia. We work uh, interdisciplinary, a lot of interactive work. So what you see here is kind of like the nexus of where our research uh, lies. So we can, we're kind of in between art design making, and it's rather fluid um, how we work in between these disciplines. But all of our work really includes, includes quite a bit of technology. And um, in our Venn diagram, you can also see that our work is generally rooted in research. So besides us being artists, we're also academics. And so uh, we have always worked, uh, in a sense, um, have a research-based work and then um, create the work based on what that research finds. So we do have a lot of areas where we actually collaborate and we create work. So one of our main focuses is digital fabrication and the two series of works we'll be talking about today lie within this realm. We also do data sonifications and visualizations. We work with the concepts of biomimicry and biodesign. Some interactive tent installations as well as wearable technology. And we do like to explore art outside the white cube. And so before we get into this though, we wanted to just talk a little bit about how this, this collaboration works. And um, essentially, we always ideate together. So whenever we come up with an idea, either Margarita comes up with an idea, or I come up with an idea, we have to convince each other that this is something to move forward, uh, where we either can get uh, funding or where we have the equipment for it, or the manpower to do it. So once we have a piece of work, then all the ideation, the research begins, and we do all of that together. But once we get into production phase, we do divvy it up. Yeah, and again, our work is crafted, our practice is funding based. So usually the work we work on is due to the fact that we have to receive funding for it. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, we can't really. We have a pretty high teaching load and uh, workload in academia, so we have to figure out how we can have research assistance and, and find money for the materials and so forth. So we're usually having a ton of different plates spinning in the air. We have a bunch of grants out at any given point in time, just kind of hoping that one hits. It's all about percentages when it comes down to it. So don't get disappointed if you're an artist right now with grants that come back negatively. Yeah, Eventually, yeah, we something we will come back. We read a lot of grants. But what is nice about being in a collaboration and like writing grants is so, for example, one starts a grant and one gets a little bit stuck on it, and I can hand off or vice versa. So research and grants in collaboration makes it makes it quite a bit easier. And so to, the two bodies of work that we're going to talk about today is one is uh, in situ, it's in situ. Um, it's our first uh, body of work that's essentially a little bit more outside of the white cube, and then this in deep body of the work where we are actually, um, that is the part of the work that's, the part, part of the body of the work that's here. So, in silico and in situ, is 3D printed sculptures that are found in habitats as well as animal enrichment. So we have four different parts of the series, one being spider rings, the other one being turtle basket platforms, pollinator watering station, and then one that we're in the process of developing and should be installing next year, uh, chimney swift habitats. And the way we got to this actually is um, we started talking a little bit to biologists at the University of Africa, my, my uh, home university, and we were like, hey, you know, we're really interested in taking the, there was a trip to London that we had, and we really became interested in taking art out of the white cube completely. And talking to this biologist, they were like, well, well, you know what, we have this field station 
that is in a 400-acre um, uh, nature preserve in Bath, Ohio. We have this field station, and you can work with these guys and potentially could work out there. And so it turned out when we started to walk, talk to the director of the field station and the manager of the field station, um, it, it, it was just a wonderful collaboration with them. They allowed us to do to put works into the field, put up works that we can have over winter even. Um, they maintained it a little bit for us. And so that's how these works started. But then with talking to them, we also found out that um, rather than just making sculptures, why not make sculptures where um, they are a little bit functional, so where we keep the animals in mind. So originally the concept came back when Marcus said from the trip to Europe, we uh, traveled to London. Uh, I was on Fulbright that year mm. for the summer, and we had a conference presentation in London, and we went to the Tate, the Tate being an incredible museum, and there was a piece by Hans Art that was this beautifully cast little bronze sculpture, and the title was Sculpture to be Lost in the Forest. Yeah. And we just kept thinking about it. We couldn't stop thinking about it. We were so influenced. And then given this opportunity of the Bath Nature Preserve and the field station, and the faculty and researchers are being so welcoming yes. and, and accepting of allowing artists to come into their, their land and, and do stuff. It was really It was, it was, it was very serendipitous, yeah, too. So, but, you know, we still work with them um, basically every day. And the first piece that we came up with is these glow up spider rings. So there's a habitat for spiders. So uh, bear with us here in a few seconds. So They're digitally printed, yes. and then light up, they have LEDs inside. And uh, this is an external shot of the Bath Nature Preserve field station that the University of Akron has. And we uh, created the habitat with a little space for the spiders to, to live in, but not the <laughs> spider biologists and no one warning us about this. We put it on the bottom and we put the spider rings in full sun. Now, of course, the minute we installed it, they're like, oh yeah, spiders don't like sun. It's like, well, you could have built this, but you okay. know, I guess something is lost in translation. Regardless, um, we did have to initially move spiders in at the beginning of the season. Yes. We've had to do that again. They don't necessarily find it on their own just yet. Um, Here's the spider moving in, by the way. It's like, hey, this is space. And it's an orb weaving spider. But we were able to move to print another piece and create the cubbies at the top of the ring. And there, there's a little black dot in the image, and that's the spider. And it usually hides, and we put it under a tree, so it's hanging from the tree, so there's that shade. shade. Um, so it did like that, so much so that after a few weeks of us nervously waiting if something was going to happen with the spider, it actually wove a web. And you can see the web there, there's a leaf in there, but lots of carnage. I guess. Well, so all these little dots in here actually are insects, and the spider in the center is hanging out, um, waiting to consume. And the idea of the light was that at night it would attract these insects, and then during the day it would just be a non dead sculpture. Yeah, some have called it arachnid dinner theater, yes, which is found quite have. humorous. Um, so that's one piece. And we do install those now, not necessarily just by the Nature Preserve reserve uh, house, the field station house, we do put them into forests with solar power. So you might be walking and hiking and then stumble upon this, this super alien, alien or halo hanging in there. Yes, that was always the sort of goal of this one. And the second piece that we thought of um, when we talked to the biologists, they were like, Ohio State Field Station is building these platforms um, to actually identify turtle species. And especially the one in our area, our researchers that they're after is the spotted turtle. And they can't always say that it's that it's there, so they, they wanted us to set up a station where they could identify it. And so the way it was done in Ohio State was just with a piece of plywood that was floating, but we said, well, why don't we make little pods? <coughs> and when we uh, thought of the pods at first, um, so we need a little angle that the turtles can actually crawl up on. And then we had a brown surface, although the first prototypes were white, and then later on they became blue, but um, the brown surface we felt would heat up a little bit more because the turtles still were really up there to bask. Um, and so the angles are for them to crawl up, and all of this is achieved um, on a large 3D printer. So this is um, fully printed in one piece, um, two foot by two foot, by about like six or so, seven inches. Uh, this is the biggest, this is by far the biggest printer. And it does take about 58 hours to print. 
So it does take a while. Um, we so, added some foam, foam to it for buoyancy. Yes. It is pretty hollow on the inside. You can see the structural uh, grid that's created by the 3D printing. And then we light them up at night. Not necessarily turtles using it, them at night. Actually, muskrats seem to really love them at night. Yes. Um, for some reason, they hang out and eat there. So it's there. So turtles, this is, this is sort of a, a little field camera that we have to track turtles. This is a mama turtle, a baby turtle, but we do um, finally, this, this season, the last season, I believe, it's in the very corner here, we found these spotted turtles. You can actually see the little spots. The biologists were happy. And we're going to actually put out a bunch more next uh, And this next was season. what, the second season? Second season. So That's when we were able to spot the turtle. So that was successful. And we do have a little video because we were quite surprised we put these cameras out to capture the turtles. And in watching this, it's almost like they do yoga because you see them stretch their leg and then they stretch their other leg and they do like, you know, uh, they don't do downward dog, but they certainly do all sorts of little poses. <laughs> so I, I do love seeing the field camera capture these little guys doing their, their movements about. And then lastly, actually you want to jump one more. Um, <coughs> lastly, the bee population that we have, is, as some of you might be aware, is, is in decline. And um, we wanted to really help out a little bit with that. And also one of the researchers at the field station is a bee specialist. And um, they planted specific pollinator gardens uh, at the field station. But there is no water source there, really, and bees have a way to drink close to rivers, um, close to any sort of stagnant um, water source where they have these little rocks they can climb into. But that, of course, is A, it requires a river, and B, it can be a little iffy with frogs. And, yeah, they seem susceptible to predators. Correct. So we wanted to develop something that we could use for them to water, uh, to, to have access to water. So we created this 3D printed watering fountain where we took the aesthetics of uh, the side of the river and there are different angles, different depths, so that as the water evaporates, you can actually still have access to the water. Um, they are put out by the pollinator garden. This one is, we did make some out of ceramics as well. As well. Um, so that has a little bit more longevity. They don't necessarily fare too well, the plastic ones during winter because of the freezing and thawing of the water. Um, not to say that these yeah, at that so, point in time. Right, so generally so we it's, have about from May to November. Yeah, well this year we've been October. Because it's so freaking cold. Um, They're still out. They are still out. <laughs> you need to keep them out. Um, and we kind of played with different forms of the, of the pedestals holding them up. But to date, we haven't necessarily caught any bees using it. We have caught different other pollinators, such as um, yellow jackets or yellow jackets as well. Oh, pollinators as well. Wasps are not, you know, they get a bad rap. Um, but uh, basically, they're, you know, the biologists are so passionate, so we do have a few of these out there. Little blue jays love these as well. Um, as well. So it's it's almost. Like they're, they're, the birds use it too, the wasps use it. I'm sure bees use it, we just haven't captured them on film. And I never thought a wasp was cute in my life until I saw the video we caught of it. And just, just take a look at it before it leaves the fountains. It's cute, it's there, it's drinking, it's, it's little antennae are twitching. But it's just incredible if you take a minute to see the nature around you. And, and you just have to do it for you. And there it goes. It's cleaning its little antennae. We, I just, when I saw that, my mouth opened and I'm like, oh my god, the wasp is very cute. Um, so it's brought a different relationship between us and wasps. Yes, that's certainly. that's certainly true. And really, the way we think of these objects are sort of as sculptures in nature. And so the next project mm -hmm. um, that we are working on is these chimney swift tiles. This is not one of ours at all, but the chimney swift is a, is a really interesting bird. That spends a lot of um, time in the air and then comes home at night to, to uh, sleep and roost in these towers. And with um, deindustrialization and uh, lots of homeowners capping their chimneys, um, they're running out of habitat. So our plan is to build these 
12 foot sculptures um, that are essentially adhere to the biologist norms of what these birds need, but then they're full on large scale digitally fabricated sculptures. And we are doing this in spring, and we are really not showing forms yet because we're, we're sort of still we're st in the we're still in development. In the so what's really fantastic is that we received a grant from the Environmental Science and Design Research Initiative Estuary from Kent State to put one on Kent campus. Ooh, in fact, Nature Academy Reserve also almost, uh, the African Audubon Society sponsored a tower for them, and I know City of Kent is also interested in putting a tower up. So this is going to be quite uh, an important project for us in 2020. Um, and the birds are adorable, and like I said, they, they spend their whole life in the air. They do everything in the air. They eat in the air. They eat bugs yeah, from mosquitoes and yeah. insects. They kind of do this crazy swooping to drink water. Um, Out of they're the air. pretty hardcore. They're and super like they adorable. Flock. Yeah, they swarm and flock. And they all, each tower has hundreds to a thousand birds in it, depending on the tower. The industrial towers have even more. And only one breeding pair per season, so that's why the numbers are declining due to the fact that industrialization, you know, chimneys are are not necessarily something that we have anymore in the United States. And so that makes us switch totally away from all nature and animals. Well, and not go really. To, well, that's true because of the shark skin replication. So we'll get to this in one second. So the second piece that especially um, is here in the gallery is called Skin Deep. Um, digital epidermal ephemeral habits, we like said, they are acronyms. And um, the idea of this piece uh, goes back to 2015, and when we started to work a little bit with biodesign, a little bit with biomimicry, at least a hint of it, we wanted to see if we can actually replicate snake skin onto, um, um, onto either an extremity or, or arm or neck or, or feet. And so the idea was that we would 3D print the cast. That cast would have to be worn um, rather statically for a while, so maybe for a good hour. And then once the cast was removed, so there was a little bit of flexibility, you could slide it out, then it would leave the pattern behind. And to our first foray, they, they weren't like really perfect. So what we have to do is scan an arm, 3D scan an arm, and make the cast precise to the model's arm, and then and actually we did get the replication of shark skin on uh, the arm. Well, serpent skin. So we were trying to, Fair conceptually, enough. it's a very layered piece, um, talking about rebirth and renewal, as well as thinking of the concept that in the future, with biotechnology, you might be able to actually enhance your skin and create all sorts of different functionality and aesthetics. You might actually make your snake, uh, snake skin, you know, skin or shark skin to make you swim mm -hmm. faster. Mm -hmm. um, but we're trying to find a way to make a commentary on that using the technology that's available today. So that's why 3D printing work. And I, of course, ended up being the guinea pig for this first series because A, we didn't have access. I couldn't keep calling the model in over and over to 3D scan and to 3D print and test. So it was a lot easier to just do this you know, yeah, there, there was a, in the studio from the very first prototypes to where this 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 snake skin replication actually mm -hmm. showed up. It it took us quite a while to get to. Yeah, that. and I have to work about forty five minutes, and then I get fifteen minutes of of a pattern time, and at the same time we were also trying to test different finishes for three D print. So we don't necessarily. I mean, the, the plastic is fine, but we wanted to create more of an artifact by giving it more of a jewelry kind of feel and look. So we did chroming as well as we tried um, copper plating, and they both worked quite nicely. And in the gallery, the way we present them is essentially like similar tips, to, to what we do here, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's tip tips, and then have detailed shots on the side. But we also present them with the prosthetic as well. So this is the leg version, um, and if you Look at another gallery shot here in the bottom, there is actually the prosthetic. So for us, uh, we're definitely interested in not only showing the outcome, the sort of really this is more a documentation yeah, of the process, process, but also show the option so that there isn't, um, there isn't that much of a mystery, so that there is more of an understanding of how we actually work with that process. So we did also want to try different parts of the body, and we're exploring more concepts in the neck and the face as well with the series. Yeah. And, 
at some point in time, we did get called to a, a conference called Body Hacking in Austin, Texas, and they wanted us to present the work. But obviously, at that point, I don't want to be going down the runway with this. Um, so we had to figure out a way to create it so that just about anyone could, could use it. So we created it with a flexible filament, and then we also started our parade into expressing typography and text. So we took the body hacking logo and printed it, and then put it on the model's arm, which was interesting. So other people were able to work, not just me. Right. So that limitation was gone. And the idea um, was the neck piece, which is in here, was that essentially the model would wear the uh, application and one pass of the runway, and then in the second pass of the runway would take it off and it would reveal what's in the under layer. So there's still this um, attempt of snakeskin plus um, the typography that's essentially cut into the neck. Lasts about 15-ish minutes, yeah. maybe 10, 10, it's really nice. Um, the, and the way we also show the prosthetic is essentially how we do this corset technique. Um, and so when, when the, the 3D print gets printed flat, um, this is called a, a flexible PLA, and once it comes off of the bed, then we can form it in um, the way we actually spin it. This was this corset technique the model has to wear. It's not very comfortable. The models aren't particularly super it excited about it. Just their their posture. Yes, that, that is very true. It makes them very much stand up straight. Yeah. And then the latest series that we're exploring with this, um, obviously the resist had political undertones and other layering messages to it, but uh, we're sort of exploring a new way of 3D printing and more ephemerality on the skin. Um, so instead of having a prosthetic, we're working with the ancient art of cupping, which is, if you haven't seen them, they're just some glass cups that get heated and put onto the body. It became most famous when the swimmer in the Olympics, what was his name, Michael Phelps, had all these marks on his back from the cupping. Um, it does uh, bruise the skin, at least bruises. So what we've done is we've 3D printed words, and the words are very specific to the model. So this one says puta, which is uh, a bad word, a bad in, word Spanish. in Spanish for uh, kind of like sex worker. Yeah. And we asked the models to reflect on a word that maybe someone had told them that really scarred them. Um, and we 3D printed a cup that we then used the vacuum to create this cupping effect, which in turn creates an embossing, and then that remains as a bruise for a period of time on the body. So we documented that process. So we're exploring different parts of the body that the models are open to showing um, in the documentation photograph. And then we're hoping to do time lapse as well of the photograph as it bruises and how it dissipates. So this is definitely more of a, of a feminist piece. Um, yes, but there, there, we had lots of conversations which, um, with not just women, with, with not just, women just there is, uh, with gay men, of course, with, with um, different races. <laughs> there's a lot of, there's lots of conversations about um, scarring conversations from from years uh, of, of... Yeah, everyone has a story which is incredible. Yeah, and, and so what we really would like to do is reflect the copying, um, also the typography reflects sort of that feeling, then describe the time, um, the time lapse of how the how it works, uh, uh, how it essentially looks on the, on the skin, but also uh, interview the model about that story and include that as a doc in the documentation. Yeah, and of course, we're taking photographs that are relatively uh, anonymity, so uh, right. we don't want the model's privacy to be invaded. Absolutely. And then there's a second version of it, more intimate space, and this is how we present it. You, again, yeah, so you have the prosthetic, have the prosthetic. you have the piece, and then you have, you'll see on the right-hand side, the, the story, the narrative written. So that's one that we're working on, and we're looking for volunteers. If anyone yeah, ever so wants to share their story, definitely let us know. And I think we're running a very good on our time because we're pretty much at the end of our presentation. So oh, good. We well, take questions well. at this time. So yeah, this is just a time lapse uh, photography, a uh, time lapse of the, um, the arm prosthetic that sits on our printer. 
So generally, we'll let this just run, and uh, we'll take some questions. So what encouraged you guys to make the move from more science, nature-based conservation work to more um, prosthetics and artwork and making things on people rather than in nature. That's interesting because both of these theories were actually developed at the same time mm -hmm. um, concurrently. So I think what linked them was the digital printing, but since I also do, since I am the fashion department, we wanted to find a way to link the 3D printing and fabrication to the body with right. still the concepts of biomimicry. Uh, or some sort of biology. So I guess the 3D printing, the biology. The biology, but also really these two bodies of work we are currently working on constantly as well. So I mean, there is, there's essentially sort of, I see it as a body of work that goes into the white cube, and then I see it as a body of work that's not in the white cube. Yeah. And, and so both of these are, and we present both bodies currently on, in our tours on whatever conferences we go. Yeah, and we have actually presented spider rings in the gallery space. Yes. Which was really yes. interesting. Without a spider in a dome. Without a spider. Yeah, no yeah. spider. Um, but the documentation piece has a light up ring that's on, on a tripod, and then it talks about the piece, and then you can go and visit it. I guess when it comes down to us deciding on what we're working on, it really depends on where our interests lay. Usually it comes from either an article Marcus is reading, or a book, or maybe we get influenced by other artists, what they're doing. Um, and it's a constant said, dialogue. It's constant dialogue. And so um, the cupping piece is something we wanted to do forever, but um, the way FFF printing works, it's actually not perfectly, so FFF is layer by layer, um, this particular printing. It's not really watertight, but we just got a new printer, which is a form, which is a stereo, um, lithography and resin, and the resin is perfectly watertight. So then we were able to take that vacuum forming um, machine, that's really kind of a handgun, and it would form the vacuum that we would need. And so in this case, the technology actually pushed it forward. And for example, these collaborations we have with the scientists also push us. So mm -hmm. when Marcus had his Fulbright in 2018, mm -hmm. we met this wonderful scientist from Idaho, and we wrote, uh, we became the consultants, the art consultants. Okay. for her NSF grant, and next next year we're going, we're actually testing right now these 3D printed rocks that are going to be fish habitat. So, uh, it nothing makes me happier to be able to work, I love animals, to be able to make something for animals and to be able to make art for these animals and to have them be part of the authors in creating, you know, making the work come alive. True. So that's just, I never thought in my life, you know, I would make fish habitats, but here I here we are. We're making, we're designing rocks, which is really strange. We are printing them. I hope that answered your question a little bit better. Yeah, and have you guys always been making collaborative artwork together, or did you start out making it individually and then you decided to come together? Well, I, uh, my career started. You've been an artist way longer than I have. Yeah, my career started in Austria, but then when I moved here, <laughs> um, we met an underground and we, we started making works there. And then we started to do... And we started a commercial business. We did like a small boutique where yeah. he would do multimedia work and I would do like 3D renderings mm -hmm. uh, for real estate developments and stuff. Before the crash. <laughs> yeah. Um, Before the crash but in Florida. We had, but yeah, but we always now did we do art. collaborate exclusively actually. There is not a whole lot. We were working with some scientists yeah. on the outside. Artwork-wise, we collaborate. Specifically. And there was there was a time I was really focused on meetings. I did a lot of meetings and interactive textiles. Um, I just we just haven't had I haven't had time to do that separately because working collaborative mm -hmm. just helped. And we strat we strategically even pushed the collaboration further um, simply because since we are academics, we have to get tenure. And if we were both pursuing individual bodies of work, it would be nearly impossible. So this way. We get to work with each other. Well, yes, we do also have a team. I mean, we have a team of, of you know people that work with us in the studio. Yeah, people that, fantastic students. Yeah, students, students uh, interns, uh, people that research employ, assistants. research assistants. So we, I mean, it, it's since we are working on two bodies of work concurrently and really kind of um, on individual on several individual projects. A big team is super helpful. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think something that you touched on, Alexa, and that I think is kind of a theme that I was seeing in here is mm -hmm. 
there's such a scientific approach to the projects that you take on. And I think, um, I guess from maybe your perspective as academics, I feel like sometimes people think like science and art are so different but I think you prove that it's not. So yeah. I guess is that something you kind of try to show through your documentation and, and showing kind of how you try different materials and kind mm -hmm. of a very scientific method approach to trying to figure out problems? And our approach isn't rigorous, so, so all we scientists out there, please don't get upset with us. We are the <laughs> first scientists, uh, maybe a lot, lot, lot later. But um, there, is, there is quite a bit of a push from STEM being, um, STEAM. being elevated to STEAM, to science and technology, and engineering, and um, what I feel that the scientists like that we bring to the table is the openness and the willingness to experiment. Scientists are sometimes laser focused on a very niche problem, but we don't care. We like to break things, and they, they seem to cherish that about us. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have any kind of things that you want to plug as uh, if people want to learn more or see your work in other places besides the right? Um, yeah, they can go to our website, benitasvogel.com. What else do we have? Um, there is actually a slide in there as well if you want to get a hold okay. of us. But yeah, it's um, Benitas Vogel at Benitas Vogel. Um, the, really, the next big project that we're working on are these, are these chimney swift towers, and the, they are coming back in April. So hopefully um, we can push those out through all possible media channels. And should we be so lucky that they actually move into our sculpture, yeah. then um, hopefully we can get some lovely videos. So that's to look forward to in spring. Again, thank you so much for, right, for having us. Yeah. Thank you all for being here. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. And thanks everyone for tuning in and hearing from Margarita and Marcus. It was a fabulous artist talk and I know I'm really excited to learn more. Uh, visit rifegallery.org for more information about the Biennial Juried Exhibition, which will again be on display until January 10th. And be sure to check out Benitez Vogel online.